visit, visit us online at booksandbooks.com for a complete listing of all our events, past and future. And while you're there, please provide us with your email address so we can keep you apprised of the over 700 events that we do here in this uh, location. You can now also sign up for our events um, on our Facebook page. You can give us the specific genres you're interested in so we can keep you, you know, up to date. I'd just like to welcome uh, Mr. Matt Hagman of the Knight Foundation to introduce tonight's author. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, there are some, I don't know, are these reserved seats? And no, like, no, so there are some seats, we have a couple seats right up here front, if you guys would like to grab a seat. We do have some seating. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, to welcome Ali Narani uh, to Miami tonight for a conversation uh, with distinguished journalist Tim Padgett with WLRN about a critically important issue, of course, here in our community uh, and across the country, immigration. You know, in, in here in Miami, in our home, we know the power of immigration. We feel it every day. I know in my own home, just in December, uh, we celebrated my mother-in-law arriving in the U.S. 50 years ago. She arrived from Cuba, going through the Freedom Tower, uh, and it's that milestone that we celebrated in December is one that countless families uh, have celebrated in our summer. How are we celebrating this evening? You know, our families, our city is built on immigration. And we all sometimes we lose sight of the fact that Miami is actually the place where over half the population is made up of people who were born outside the U.S., not in. Immigration drives our art and cultural life. Immigration drives innovation here in Miami and around the world. We are a city of immigrants, and we see the great benefits of immigration. And yet, immigration remains a point of real contention of our country see in our politics every day. To make sense of it, to begin to make sense of it, we have Ali Nurani with us, who has authored his new book, There Goes the Neighborhood, How Communities Overcome Prejudice and Meet the Challenge of American Immigration. Ali Nurani is the Executive Director of the National Immigration Forum, an advocacy organization promoting the value of immigrants in immigration, something that we all know well here in Miami. Growing up in California as the son of Pakistani immigrants, Ali quickly learned how to forge alliances of, of wide-ranging people of, from wide-ranging backgrounds, a skill that has served him extraordinarily well as one of the nation's most innovative coalition builders and is being put to the test like any time before. Before joining the forum, Ali was the executive director of the Massachusetts Immigrant and Refugees Advocacy Coalition, and he has served in leadership roles within public health and environmental organizations. In 2015, Ali was named a lifetime member of the Council of Foreign Relations. He holds a master's from Boston University and is a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley, and now he is an author too, as we learn about his first book. Please welcome Tim Padgett. Oh, I need to get you the mic. <laughs> Sorry, I left you hanging. I have this one. That's for that That's for you, Tim. That's you. okay. And I, I believe uh, to begin, you're sure. going you're going to uh, uh, grace us with a, a reading. Well, I mean, first of all, I want to uh, uh, thank Tim for for joining us this evening. I want to thank the, the Knight Foundation for sponsoring, uh, generously sponsoring the reception um, uh, and uh, for all of the amazing work that they do here in Miami and across the country. I want to thank Books and Books. Um, I have to say, I was telling Christina before this, is that you know many people I've talked to about this event have been quite upset uh, because they've said, you know, the only reason I want to write a book is because I want to do a reading of Books and Books. Um, <laughs> So uh, it's with it's it's a real it's a real honor to be here, and I, I'm tremendously grateful. And I I want to also thank uh, the de facto mayor of Miami, our communications director Kathleen Farrell. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I'd like to add, I want I 
too, want to salute Kathleen. She's the best journalist who ever left Miami. <laughs> and um, we're, we're very, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to see her uh, back in Miami tonight. Welcome, Kathleen. <laughs> Uh, so I thought I would uh, start with uh, uh, reading just a, a couple of paragraphs from the, the final chapter of the, the I'm sorry, the final couple of pages of the first chapter. And just to set the context is that um, I started the book on uh, one particular day, December 18th, 2010. Uh, and it was the day where two things happened, where uh, the Dream Act was defeated and Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. <clears throat> The political power to force a vote on sound policy got us within one mile of the finish line. What we learned is that last mile, riddled with the landmines of race and class, is not completed by politics and policy alone. That last mile is America's identity crisis. Elections matter, but culture matters more. Moving forward, in order to answer these questions of identity, we needed to prioritize culture over politics and policy. We needed a strategy to win that last, toughest mile. And the rancor and the rhetoric of 2010, which, let's be honest, seems so quaint these days, was shaking loose new enemies as well as new allies. Right now, too many Americans and media assume there goes the neighborhood when immigrants become a part of their communities. Until conservative white America sees the cultural and demographic changes to their neighborhoods as a net positive for their, their lives, this will remain the assumption and the identity wars will only worsen. In the lobby of the Methodist Church that afternoon in December 2010, I remember telling a colleague without fully understanding what I was getting at, we are going to do things differently next time. Which is what this story is about, a different approach to the immigration debate. This is not a story about the next legislative fight. This is a story about Americans dealing with immigration to their neighborhoods. What America struggles with is bigger than any one piece of legislation. I believe that by not understanding the fears behind America's identity crisis, we fail to provide the framework and vehicle through which we can reach Americans' hearts and minds. Solving this problem is not impossible. Liberal or conservative, we need to be willing to meet people where they are, but not leave them there. Um, congratulations on writing this book. And I say that sincerely because it's, it really is one of those rare books that hands us a fresh and important prism through which to view a long-standing problem, in, in this case, immigration reform. And what, what really drew me to this book uh, more and more as I read it is that it urges pro-immigration advocates to engage people beyond liberal bubbles like Miami uh, and understand their fears and, yes, their anger. Uh, about immigration, to understand, as, as, as Ali's reading here just so aptly put it, to understand the cultural debate going on about immigration and not just the political debate, because as, as you so effectively point out in this book, unless you engage the former, you're never going to win the latter. And uh, I, again, I, th I think that's really you know, the, the, the important kernel of, of, of this book that, that, that you'll take away when, when, when you read it. So just to get things rolling here. Ali, I, really, I, I wanted to, to, to kick it off with really what I think is the most important question of all. Why does Lou Dobbs like this book so much? <laughs> <laughs> so just a little, should I give some context here? <laughs> really, why, why does Lou Dobbs like this book? Well, um, strangely enough, I've gotten to know Lou over the, the, the years. I've done his shows uh, more, than, more than once. Um, and he agreed to do an interview for the book. Uh, so last April, March, I was in New York, and we sat down and had this conversation. And, you know, with Lou Dobbs, who is somebody, you know, it's very easy for people on my side of the immigration ledger to say, you know what, you're wrong, I fundamentally disagree with you on everything that you say and believe, um, and you never talk to them again. Uh, and that's true. There's not a whole lot that I agree with on Lou Dobbs. With, uh, with, uh, with, with Lou on. But there is one thing that I agree with Lou on, is that we need an immigration debate that's more, that's based on respect and based on the truth. Now we can debate on what respect means, what the truth means, uh, but what Tim is, is uh, mentioning is that, so last week I went on to the show with Lou and, uh, you know, he kind of, uh, we went back and forth a little bit, tussled a little bit, but then he was kind enough to hold up the book and said, uh, you know, and we highly recommend it. 
Yeah, and that's, that's why my legs and arms fell off. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, but really, actually, you know, I, I didn't ask that to just to be a smart ass, really. I, what, what I asked that really because I think the reason that Lou Dobbs likes this is the reason that all of you will, or at least should, uh, like this book because it does try, in a way that no other book on immigration I've read, it does try to uh, find that potential common ground between. Uh, you know, the conservative set and the liberal set when it comes to immigration reform, an issue that if we don't get figured out in this country is really going to hurt us as we move forward in the 21st century. And when you and I were in the WLRN studios the other day, we were talking about uh, my home state, Indiana, and which is perceived as very conservative. And yet, we were talking about one of the, one of the uh, more interesting passages in that book about a gentleman named Greg Zeller, uh, who's the attorney general there, who stood up to Mike Pence, then governor, now vice president, uh, who wanted to block Syrian refugees uh, from coming uh, to Indiana. Not the proudest moment uh, for a Hoosier like me. Uh, not in Indiana. Not in Indiana, right. I, I corrected him on that as well. Oh, but. Uh, but one of the things that struck me uh, was that, you know, you... I think mentioned that even though Zeller is not an immigration advocate, he taught you how to navigate the anti-immigration waters perhaps better than any immigrant advocate ever did. Why? Well, so Greg Zeller um, is a devout Catholic. Uh, he, you know, he tells me when I interviewed him, and I wrote this in the book, he said that you know out of his family, I think of six, you know, the understanding was that at least one son was going to go into seminary. And uh, it turned out, you know, one brother was close, but ended up going to music school. And they all thought that Greg was going to be the person, uh, but didn't, you know, he went on to become a lawyer instead. Because uh, for him, it was a call to service. And he felt that going into the law, there was an element of, of, of serving people. And for Greg, who grew up in southern Indiana on the shores of the Mississippi, uh, literally gazing across the river at the big city, um, it was about treating people the right way, as well as about enforcing the law. So at this moment in time, when um, Governor, then Governor Pence made the statement that you know, he no longer wanted Syrian refugees to be re resettled in Indiana, Greg was caught in this dilemma. And this dilemma was between the rule of law and being a compassionate Catholic. And he tells me the story of, okay, what's the legal strategy to fulfill his legal obligation to defend the state, to stretch the case, but what's his moral obligation as a Catholic, as a member of the Catholic Charities Board of Directors that was leading refugee resettlement in Indiana, um, what, how does he navigate those? And it, his, the tension that he felt, the dilemma that he faced, would come up over and over and over again with practically any person that I talked to um, who, who looked at this issue from a rule of law perspective and as well and a, a moral perspective. Yeah. But what then compelled you to get out and meet people like Greg Zeller? What was the overarching motivation for writing this book? So in the, the first chapter, I, you know, I, I focus in on December 18th, 2010. And um, it was at that, on that day where we realized that the strategy that the immigrant rights movement had used in 2010 was by and large a political strategy. Let's re you know, naturalize immigrants, let's register them to vote, and let's make sure the Democrats are in power. You know, let's you know, and that 2010 midterm election, you know, Nevada and Colorado was the like it was the, the Western firewall that was there because of the Latino vote. The don't ask, don't tell community. We didn't have a dog in that fight. They didn't run a political strategy. They ran a strategy based on culture, based on engaging the military establishment, based on describing their family, and they won. Uh, so at that moment. The National Immigration Forum, the organization that I, that I run, uh, we decided, well, we're going to do something different. It doesn't mean that we're going to veer away from our colleagues and allies in the immigrant rights community, but we're going to make sure that we're going to engage the conservative and moderate faith, law enforcement, and business community in a cultural strategy because, you know, there are not enough Latino, Asian, new American voters in every congressional district in the country to, to make it a political battle. It's a, it's a cultural battle. And, um, you know, hence your, your message there in that first chapter, that culture matters, but our elections matter, but culture matters more. Um, now, again, as we were pointing out, you know, people like Greg Zeller, but you go all over the country in this book. You talk to uh, Donald Trump supporters in South Carolina, but you also talk to people like uh, our Archbishop uh, Thomas Wenske here uh, in, in Miami. 
Um, what were the, you know, sort of what you and I were discussing yesterday, what were the most important things you learned and took away from your encounters with, with that yep. very vast spectrum of people? So over the course of, you know, about three, three and a half months, I traveled across the country, interviewed you know, somewhere between 50 and 60 faith, law enforcement, business, and community leaders. Um, both from, and the majority were certainly conservative and moderate. There were a number who were, you know, you would identify as, as you know, to the left or liberal. <clears throat> but there was a consistency. Um, and they used a different, you know, they might have used a different language, but I would say those consistent themes were family, uh, safety, and prosperity. And you know, again, people might use a slightly different word and a slightly different, and the context might be different, but you know, for the evangelical pastor, it was about the sanctity of family. For the Republican sheriff in Central Valley, California, it was about the public safety of the entirety of their community, regardless of immigration status. Um, for the you know business owner, whether it was Andy Grove who founded in who, who led Intel to its peaks, or a farmer in rural Washington, it was about their workforce being an extension of their family. Um, so it was, it was there, were, there were consistent through lines, regardless of who I talked to. But as, you know, as we were discussing before, you know, Miami is this epitome of you know, an immigrant city. I mean, the joke here is that Latin Americans uh, love Miami so much because it's so close to the United States. And I, I think that uh, we ought to be serving as an example. In fact, I was telling you yesterday, you know, Human Rights Watch just opened uh, an office here in Miami. And I went to the interview with the head of Human Rights Watch, and I wanted to ask him, oh, this is great. This is going to help you project out to Latin America. He says, yeah, but more important, it's going to help us to project into the United States. We want to use Miami as a showcase for how an immigrant uh, experience phenomenon works. How can we in Miami help people in Kansas see that that kind of engagement in a community can work and, and is not a threat? Yeah. So one of the, uh, you mentioned this, the, the interview that I did with Archbishop Wenske. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Archbishop Wenske and the stories that he tells about uh, um, you know, helping Haitian refugees, helping Cuban refugees, helping just this incredibly diverse immigrant community now, um, is very, illustri illustrates the vitality and the vision of Miami and South Florida. But it also, I think, illustrates you know, what the rest of the country can learn from, uh, uh, from Miami. Because the way he described it to me in, in, the, in the conversation was that there was a difference between, you know, a natural law, in essence, a person's very natural decision to move. Whether it was, you know, fleeing Cuba or fleeing Miami or, you know, pick your country or just coming for better opportunities. It's a very natural decision versus a, a, a prescriptive decision of law which is trying to control a natural decision. Um, and I, the reason I found the framework they presented so interesting because I think the rest of the country, again, grapples with this tension. It's like, what is a perfectly rational decision for any mother or father to make for their family? It is to make sure that their child does better than them. But then why as a country are we always trying to control that and when, when it comes to migration? Um, and I think the Miami experience uh, um, can provide so much to the, to the country. Now, you, on a more personal level, you were born in the U.S., um, your parents are Pakistani immigrants, you grew up in California, watching that sort of uneasy dynamic between whites and Latinos and other immigrant groups, and, and on top of all that, you call yourself a card-carrying liberal uh, mm -hmm. in, in the book. But what is it about yourself that changed? Um, as a result of researching and writing this book and engaging all yep. of those people all across the country? Well, I, you know, I would say about 60 or 70 percent of the people that I interviewed, we were already working with in some way. So it wasn't the first conversation I'd had with folks. So I want to, you know, I, I feel like that's important that, you know, the book, while it certainly points forward, it also captures, I think, the work of the National Immigration Forum and just our incredible staff who um, are, who do this work on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, so it's not just the conversation I had in the interview that changed me, but it's really been the work over the last five or six years that have changed me personally, I think, organizationally. And what that means is that you have to be comfortable operating in a gray area. You have to be comfortable having that initial conversation where, okay, you know, you and I are going to agree on immigration. But in that conversation, 
I'm going to do everything I can to understand what your fears are. You know, what's the source of your anxiety? Uh, and it's not my job or my role in that conversation to dismiss that anxiety, to ignore it, or even to try to solve it. But Americans aren't very good at that. Yeah, we're quite awful though. Yes. <laughs> Most marriages aren't good at that. <laughs> <laughs> but particularly today, and you and I were just also discussing, you know, how many, for example, I, I, I see a lot of parallels in what you're trying to do in this book with what, for example, J.D. Vance was trying to do in Hillbilly Elegy, getting Americans like all of you to understand Americans like the one, the ones that he talks to uh, in, in this book. Um, how hard do you see that being for Americans right now to step into that gray area for liberals to read Hillbilly Elegy and conservatives to read your book, et cetera? How hard is that for us these days? Um, the assumption is that it's hard. Uh, but I think, and this is a maybe just unique to immigration, but when people ask me, okay, well, what's it been like for the last five years? I have, a, I'll give you the same answer today that I'll give you uh, a year ago. It is probably the easiest thing I'll ever do and the most fun thing I'll ever do. Because whether it was these interviews that I did for the book or the work that we've done in the last five years, we've just found that you know, conservative America or even liberal America, they just want to be a part of the conversation, be a part of a conversation that respects their point of view. Um, so yes, the assumption is that it's really hard. And I'm not saying it's, not, it's going to be easy, but we got to have to get past that. And you, as you said on WLRN this morning, you, you see a lot of hope. Um, and, and so much of today's immigration debate, as we've just been saying, is all about left versus right. But is there really a silent majority in the middle waiting to be engaged, as far as you're concerned? Uh, absolutely. I, I think that you know, there are 20% of Americans who, we're not going to get on this issue. And that's fine. They can go about, you know, that's okay. There are 20% of Americans who are with us you know, whole hog. So that's that 60% in the middle that I think are pushed and pulled by, you know, the dystopian talking points that are lobbed back and forth. And they're looking for a message, or even more importantly, a messenger that they trust that they can say, okay, I can have an honest conversation with this person. Um, so I do think that there's a middle in the country. And but, but, but let's get more specific about that. What is the biggest fear most Americans in the 21st century have about immigration? I mean, do they really fear that our dramatically changing demographics uh, is having a negative effect, not just on their neighborhoods, that's the ironic title of your, of your book, but on the country as a whole? I mean, do they really believe immigrants are stealing their jobs, or is, is the fear about something more existential? Can you get a little more specific for us about what that fear, what, what is tugging them, is, to use your word? I think it's, um, so there's a, a great, the study that I keep going back to, and I, have, I haven't seen anything sharper than this, is that last summer, uh, I think it was Kenneth Rothman from uh, a researcher with Gallup analyzed their survey. There's no weekly sample. And this is, the Gallup sample poll is what, 30,000 people. So it's a big chunk of the public. Uh, they found that the Trump voter within that sample was economically better off than most Republicans, uh, lived in, their jobs were protected from trade, lived in a culturally isolated community. But the trigger for them in terms of being a Trump voter was that they felt, they were worried their child would not do better than them. So, it's, it's impossible. What I took away from that study is that it's not any one factor. It's a combination of cultural isolation, it's a combination, uh, along with, you know, feeling like your job is going to be taken away, making life harder for your kids. Um, so in that way, our strategy has to be, it can't just be a single shot strategy. It has to be a strategy that engages somebody based on, okay, you live in a culturally isolated community. What is that? What's that fear? Why? You feel like your child isn't going to do better than you. Why? What can, and, and so it's a combination of race, it's co class, uh, um, culture. It's you know there's not a, there's not a single issue. There's not a single answer, and that's that's what makes it so hard. So, how do immigrant immigration proponents, uh, both whether they're political leaders or just lay people like us, how do we allay those fears? And and, and if, if with your permission, I'd like to I'd like to go back to Zeller in Indiana sure. and read something uh, that really stood out for me that he said uh, in your book. Uh, in fact, you say here, right, as Zeller put it best, and I quote him, it's easier to fear something you don't understand. He felt that, quote, leaders who appeal to the better angels of our nature, as Lincoln once said, rather than appeal to the dark forces of fear and anger, as is currently being practiced, need to step forward. Immigration reform will be difficult until public fears are addressed 
by better leaders. Where are, the, where are those going to come from? And that's the challenge of the moment. The challenge of the moment is that we, can, we can't depend on our elected officials any longer to lead a conversation that's based on a cultural or value prism that brings people together. That's our reality. Um, and I'm not, I don't mean that to oversimplify and say every elected official is that person. Um, so, but regardless, that puts a lot more pressure on each one of us in this room. Um, and how do we have, how do we lead that conversation? So for us as an organization, we want to engage the pastor, the police chief, the business owner as kind of a combination of perspectives on these cultural changes that are happening in neighborhoods. Um, because that's the leadership that is going to lead us forward. And what is, yes, a really difficult time, but the reason I left the project with optimism, the reason that I, the organization leads me with optimism is because I think there are a lot more of those folks out there than we realize. For example, uh, you know, our Congress people here from Miami, they're very pro-immigration. I mean, I'll, I'll uh, argue with Ileana ross Layton until the cow comes home about Cuba, but she and I agree about immigration. Um, how do we get leaders like her to project herself beyond South Florida into the heartland? I think that, you know, whether it's Ileana, uh, Mario, uh, Carvello, you know, they have a very unique perspective in terms of representing a district, or, or I'm sorry, a region that is so diverse, uh, but diverse in ways that I don't think the rest of the country understands. I mean, you go through South Florida, you know, you can go, it's, you know, Cuba, Haiti, South America, you know, the South of America. <laughs> uh, all in one the place. Same, the same here is that the further north you go in Florida, the further south you go. Right. And, that's a, and that's a great thing. That's a great thing. So, I mean, and, you know, I felt like Senator Rubio had figured that out for a hot second. He's been able to. Hot second. <laughs> in that opening chapter that they described in 2010 when the Senate rejected the DREAM Act uh, which would have given undocumented migrants who were brought here as children of half the citizenship and you point out that same day the Senate voted to let gays serve openly in the military. What are the lessons, uh, and, and I'm just asking you to be a little more specific uh, about this very important uh, 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 parallel. I think there are a few specific things. One is that the LGBT, no, let me, before I even get there, they're very different movements. They're very different issues. Um, so I don't draw parallels uh, nonchalantly. I you know, have a lot of respect for the LGBT community, but I don't think they deal with the questions of race and class in anywhere near the same way as the immigrant rights community. Um, so with that disclaimer, uh, I will say that the LGBT community has done a great job of engaging the debate based on family, based on the, you know, the sanctity of the family, engaging the military establishment, especially with respect to Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And the problem is that for us, we talk about family, but we talk about family in a very um, insular way. Meaning that it's, it's, always, you know, it's about a, and I think this is changing now, but it's always about the Latino family, family the Asian family. Um, you know, Dick Longworth, who is, was a reporter with the Chicago Tribune, um, he wrote a great book that in many ways was an inspiration for this, and it was one of the first people I interviewed. Uh, the book was uh, Caught in the Middle, uh, The Midwest and Globalization. And when I was interviewing him, we were talking about this, you know, demographics and how people are relating to each other, and the question of the wall came up. And um, he gave me this great quote, a line where he said, it doesn't matter how, you know, how high the wall is that Trump wants to build, it still won't stop hormones. <laughs> So culture will change, demographics will change, um, but unless we as a movement and people who care about this issue are very in, uh, 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 intentional about it, it's not gonna happen. So back to Lou Dobbs. Um, <laughs> I was particularly taken by the chapter that mentions the conservative TV commentator and his criticism of US business and how it exploits cheap immigrant labor but largely hides from the immigration controversy, but you say American farmers, uh, and, and this is also a, a, an issue important to us when you look down on the Redlands, for example, um, you say the American farmer is different. You call the American farmers some of the most compelling conservative spokespeople when it comes to immigrants. Why? 
Well, I would use the, the example of um, HB 56 in Alabama. This was a state law in Alabama that was uh, designed very similar, if not even more, uh, uh, more harsh than the Arizona's SB 1070 <coughs> Show Me Your Papers law. So this law passed in uh, 2011, I believe, um, and there was a massive outcry, right? So the civil rights community, the faith community, and others really pushed back hard against uh, uh, the governor and state legislators. And as I did the research, I found there were two, uh, and that was all incredibly important. It created a base of, of, of energy. The other players in that, that uh, pushback were, um, number one was BMW. They just built a big factory there, and one of the first people arrested under this law was an engineer from BMW who was pulled over because he didn't have, and arrested because he didn't have his driver's license with him. But the, um, the person that really, or the, the party that really changed the needle, moved the needle, was the Alabama family farmer. There were articles where family farmers in Alabama confronted the state legislators who had sponsored and really pushed through this law and said, in essence, you're killing our workforce, you're putting us out of business as a family, what are you doing? Uh, and you know, for me as an advocate to say that to an Alabama legislator, right, who cares? But when it's a homegrown, family-owned farm from Alabama saying, you're hurting you know, my family and the extension of my family being my workforce, that's a very different conversation. Well, I just have one last question then before we hand the floor to all of you. And uh, uh, of course, we, we can't get through a discussion of this issue without talking about Donald Trump. Now, you sent this to the publisher when? Uh, final, the final, so I got the, my initial deadline is October 1, and then the final was like after the, like December 1. Yeah, so more or less when, when he was elected. Yeah, yeah, and so, uh, so is it safe for me to say then that his election more or less confirms most of what you're trying to get across uh, in this book? And, and as a result, how, how hard will it be to achieve immigration reform while he's in the White House and the Republicans control the Congress? Or, as you and I were discussing yesterday, is there maybe a chance for a Nixon in China moment yeah. here? that he could actually be the guy who, who pushes immigration reform. Well, it's, uh, just in terms of getting the book in, the final manuscript in, um, I actually made very, very, very few substantive changes to the text, to the manuscript after the election. Um, the stories remain the same, uh, uh, the strategy may remain the same, the challenges remain the same, uh, the direction remains the same. Obviously, the context is very different, which was somewhat surprising, I'll be honest. Um, so that's important. Uh, as I said yesterday, I think this goes beyond a Nixon goes to China moment if Donald Trump was to take that step. Um, but I gotta say, I've been involved in this issue for you know over 10 years, and I've had multiple Republicans come to me and say, you know, one of the big reasons I don't vote for immigration reform is because the Democrats will get the credit. All right. Well, for the next two to four years, Republicans get full and fair credit for everything immigration <laughs> Um, and you know we have a cultural, and we can demonstrate that within their base there is support, or at least there's a debate on this issue. Um, and you know, if the if the most we can do over the next two to four years is play smart defense, get the narrative back on track so that the country once again values immigrants and immigration, that's a big win. And that alone is going to take a tremendous amount of work. Um, if we get more than that, that's ISIS. Now, no. You all have a lot of questions, uh, so let's um, let's, uh, let's throw, throw the floor to you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hi, um, Ellie, thank you for being here. It's really, I'm really glad to hear about what you're doing with your book. Uh, my name is Anna Ruiz. Uh, I'm a social media strategist and storytelling content creator and an online radio host for a company called Analytical Beat. I'm pretty new, but this is my question to you. First of all, thank you for recognizing that Miami is uh, really an example to the rest of the places and cities. And I don't say that to any other city. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not, right, right, this might not take that well. But uh, it is an example on how uh, cultural diversity has been sort of integrated or accepted. I don't know what word is the correct word to use. We have our own struggles and we continue working through them, but we are an example throughout the nation in that sense. Now, in your research, uh, were you able to kind of 
divide the people that you were interviewing based on generational demographics? Because I'd like to know, um, I, I understand that they have valid concerns, but is uh, the Gen X population different than the millennial population? And, and additionally, what kind of things, if not right now for the government that we have right now, what kind of things are you planning in the future for their children that might move some of these ideas forward? Because maybe it will be a challenge to make other people in older generations understand this, but as we know, the internet has opened a lot of doors for a lot of people, and a lot of the early, younger generations are native technologists. They're gonna be exposed to a lot of sorts of information. How would you tackle that, or is that mentioned in your book? So, um, I'll be honest with you, I, I uh, and this is and nothing against any of the millennials in the room, but I totally ignore the millennials. Uh, uh, I'm just not worried about them, right? Uh, this is, and the, the closest I get is that you know, a lot of us will say, well, demographic is destiny. You know, it's the next generation that's going to make the world better. Okay. But what about the generation that is currently between 50, uh, 50 years and above? They're not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and Frank, I, I really strongly believe that if we skip over that generation and ignore their concerns, then we're not really solving all the problems that we need to solve moving forward. So, you know, so demographics I do not believe is destiny. Um, uh, I, I spent, I think I want to say about 90% of the interviews I did were with folks who were pretty far along in their, in their professional life. Um, and that they are the ones that were speaking to uh, uh, a, an older audience. Uh, and they're the ones who are faced with these challenges of, okay, how do you move, um, you know, the American public writ large? And, Yes, millennials are growing up in a more diverse, more technologically savvy society. Um, and that's going to change us moving forward. But that's not our challenge right now. Our challenge right now is that everybody else is really scared. But there is a gentleman that you talked to in South Carolina yep. who makes the very salient point that my grandfather was less prejudiced than his father, my father was less prejudiced than my grandfather, etc. And my kids are going to be a hell of a lot less prejudiced than I am. Yep. So they're you did yeah. you did sort of indirectly right so um, Tim's referring to uh, Harold Smith um, who uh, born and raised in South Carolina um, and another uh, quote he gave me was um, as we were talking on a super Tuesday in March of last year we're sitting in his living room you know CNN is flickering in the background and he's on his recliner uh, um, and he tells me you know my granddaddy didn't own slaves my daddy didn't own slaves I didn't own slaves so why is everything my fault <laughs> I just want to go to work, just like you. Uh, and he was a Trump voter. And he told me about going to the primary election in South Carolina and voting for Trump. And uh, he called me. And um, and Harold, just you know, he's a supporter of immigration reform, supporter of the immigrant community that he you know he, he's come to know. And I said, Harold, and he says, no, nah. and he he's worried. Well, the other really important piece of context that you point out there is the South Carolinas. Yeah, I just have got my. Hi, thank oh, you. oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, okay. I apologize. <coughs> so my name is Olga Fernandez. I'm a Colombian journalist based in Colombia. I'm here just for vacation. Just for this? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I have a question. You already told us a little bit about the good things of immigration, like cultural and economics. And can you tell us a little bit what you find in your research that is the bad things about immigration? Or is there something yep, yep. So it, immigration scares people. It leads to economic fear, it leads to a physical fear, uh, it leads to a level of anxiety for an incredible number of Americans. And that's a very strange thing to say in here in a city like Miami. Or maybe it is, I don't know. Um, and you can, you, know, you, can, you can quantify that fear on any of a number of data sets. You, know, you can quibble about this data set versus that data set, this study versus that study. Um, so I'm not going to sit here and say uh, uh, immigration is readily accepted by all Americans. I mean, that's really, you know, it's pretty obvious. I mean, the question is, is how do you acknowledge and, and, uh, and address those anxieties? Um, and the way, the strategy we've put forward, the strategy that I wrote about, is that you, you can address those anxieties through a faith frame, or the framework of faith. What, you know, I spent time in, in Utah. Um, went to General Conference, which is the semi-annual gathering of Mormons, uh, the Mormon community, which had 
21,000 people in an auditorium. Uh, and it was an amazing moment because it was the afternoon where uh, a couple of the sermons were about refugee resettlement. And the place was just dead silent. Um, you can engage people based on their public safety or law enforcement concerns. And, you know, the Greg Zellers of the world, the Republican sheriffs and attorneys general, how they talk about national security and local security. You can talk to people, you can engage people on their economic anxieties and make the case that, you know, give you a, a very timely example. I was in um, Idaho three and a half weeks ago. Met with the Idaho Dairymen Association. Unemployment of less than 4%. Half a million cows in the state of Idaho that need to be milked three or four times a day. These dairymen, a number of them who voted for Donald Trump, were incredibly angry because their workers, who they've known for years, who they've come to see as an extension of their family, are terrified to go to work. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, if you, and, and the, the case they made is that, okay, if I lose my workforce, I've lost an extension of my family, but I've also lost my business. The state loses, everybody else loses. So, again, it's not it's not a, a single shot, you know, political case that we have to make. It is a broad case we have to make because the anxieties are broader than any one one angle. Yeah. Um, I, I'm Isabel from Kathleen. Everybody's a friend of Kathleen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and we, the same right, I got, you got um, the no, one of the things that I keep thinking, um, and I just want your take on this, I think a big component of the immigration issue is racism. And um, I think the difference between the immigrants today are that the immigrants, the vast majority, are black and brown, and the immigrants from the turn of the century, the early 1900s, and throughout the 20th century, were basically European white. And I think the U.S. was able to assimilate and accept that they were Eastern European, and they were Jewish, and oh, they were Italian, oh my God, the Irish, but they were white, and they were European. How big a factor is the fact that immigration today is primarily Asian, and you know, from Central and South America, and Black and Brown? I think that um, you know, the uniquely American perspective and response to immigration from the days of the early 20th century to today is a combination of race and class. Because even you know, for the Irish and the Italian immigrant in the 1920s, they were treated with, they were, they were, they were treated terribly. Um, and that was you know, an ethnic issue that was, uh, so it may not have been you know, kind of what we see as racism, but you, know, you can call it ethnicism or something like that. Um, I think that today it is this combination of race and class and that uh, if we engage in this debate and tell anybody who has anxieties or fears about immigration, well, you know, that must mean you're a racist. There's no moving that person. Right. Um, I just, and I'm not saying it was what you're getting at. Um, but how do you deal with that component of their fear? So I think, so there's two things here. One is um, the immigrant community is now in more parts of the country than ever before, right? So in the Midwest, you see more and more towns who are surviving only because of an infusion of immigrants and refugees. So how do you take those examples and make them broader than that one city? So the, the town 50 miles down the road who is trying to build a wall around itself, see that they've kind of made the wrong decision based on uh, a fear that's, that ties back to race and class. Um, I think that the way you relay that fear is to find the messengers that people will trust. And that is somebody who, more times than not, is not an immigrant, right. right? And who is standing next to the person who's an immigrant and says, you know what, this is this is working out for us. Um, and I just think in the past we we've, we've made the mistake of you know, making the case just purely on you know changing demographics and changing politics. Um, hi, I'm Cuban, and I came in '61 through Operation Peter Pan. You talk about families, you know, families are you know really precious you know, in the Latin community as well as the Asian community and also in the Pakistani communities. Um, and I think the, the, the division and the split of the families becomes a real factor in the, in the immigration policy. You know, to separate the kids, you know, we, were, we came, 14,000 of us came, and we, you know, we lived in orphanages, and we lived in foster homes, and we're divided by a whole immigration policy. And we're just like, we're, we're going back, we're going back like 50 years. You know, I, I grew up in a foster home in Chicago, and then 
I went to USC, I went to Berkeley, I went to USC in LA. And so I was involved in the, in the civil rights movement. But you know, again, we go back to the families, you know, the families are the tools. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna separate the kids. You know, the kids living, living in, you know, in jails, you know, in Arizona, you know, you know what kind of uh, humanity, we talk about human rights here. You know, and we, we told you this is a total violation, you know, the human rights, you know, and we, you know, and all this racism is being promoted by the politicians. I mean, the whole, the whole consciousness of, you know, of the U.S. today is a racist, total, you know, and, and you know, demeaning and humiliating of the immigrants. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, we should not even, you know, and who, who picks tomatoes? Who picks lettuces? No white American picks it. No black American does 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 uh, agrarian agrarian work anymore. If they used to pick cotton. Now they don't. They don't need. They don't do the agricultural work. So I would say that one of the, one of the parallels here is the um, unaccompanied minor crisis from 2014, where you saw mothers and families uh, fleeing the violence in the Northern Triangle. I think that you know at that moment in time the Obama administration reacted complete, absolutely the wrong way. They uh, tried to, you know, they had this entire idea that if they uh, um, made a, a message clear that children and families would not be able to stay in the U.S. and they would be deported, that they would deter families from making that very, very desperate decision to flee this violence. Um, and I just thought that that decision by the, by the administration and by the president was wrong. And eventually they changed. Eventually they, they found, figured out a way to, to manage this flow. But... I think there's a, a question of uh, how are we how are we as a nation operating in a very new uh, global environment where um, you know what's happening in you know just south of the border um, is no longer you know tens of thousands of miles away or feels to the it's it's there and I think we just need to have a different investment of attention in there. Look, is she on the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I'm uh, Nick Jimenez. I'm a senior editor at Cigar Schnapp Magazine, which is relevant to the, uh, the question that I was asked. So you brought up dairy farmers uh, yeah. and some of the ones you spoke to and how uh, they've reacted to the prospect of, you know, the, or, or the reality of their workers being afraid to show up at work. I wonder whether you could expand a little bit on, uh, it, so assuming that you touched on this with them, what sort of calculations they made of them. Because going into that election, they must have been aware uh, their workers were not about to vote Trump with them. Um, and I'm thinking specifically, uh, I guess uh, my point of reference is the cigar industry. So at the most recent uh, trade show, which was this past July, uh, we did a little very unscientific poll, but you know, it's a pretty small industry, so we came close to, to having a good sample size. Um, and this is an industry that is anywhere in the country dominated not by uh, by Cubans, by Nicaraguans, by Mexicans, by Dominicans, and by Hondurans. And I want to say of the two or three dozen people uh, who I actually went to and, and asked on camera, we got maybe three people saying, I'm voting for Hillary Clinton. Uh, we had more people voting for Johnson, myself included, <laughs> than we're voting for Clinton. Uh, everybody else was voting for Trump. Uh, and the way that I see this as being relevant is, uh, you have an industry that was faced with this calculation of, uh, I'm Nicaraguan, and my sales force is Nicaraguan, or Cuban, or Dominican, because here in the US, it's, it's dominated by Cubans and Nicaraguans and Dominicans. Um, on the one hand, I face uh, you know, uh, the prospect of, a, of an administration that puts my ability to import my labor force at risk, but on the other hand, in the last months of the Obama administration, the FDA passed regulations that put the entire industry uh, in jeopardy. Um, and I, I won't go into the specifics, but it really was, I mean, I, I only might have a job now because it wasn't Clinton who won. That doesn't mean I'm a huge Trump fan, but I only have a job now because Trump won. Um, so what were some of the ways that you saw people making that, what is ultimately a very difficult calculation, because you're talking about... They made the same, I mean, they made the calculations the same way that everybody you interviewed. On the one hand, they might be afraid to come, on the other hand, they might not have a job to come to. Right, I mean, so this is the thing. It's like, this is not a, this is a challenge about immigration is that it's rarely a top tier issue for a voter. I think that may be changing moving forward given the, the, uh, the drastic nature of the moment we're in now. Um, but in that election in 2016, there were a lot of issues on the table for folks as they were entering that, that, uh, uh, that booth. Um, 
And, you know, the best I can do is respect people's votes. If I don't respect people's vote in that decision, then there's no moving moving forward after that. Hi, Laura Weitzman here. I wanted to ask you a little bit, you made some comparisons and contrasts with the LGBTQ movement, and I was curious when you compare it to the 1960s civil rights movement, how the strategy of the faith outreach and is similar and different, and, and what successes did they have that the immigrant rights movement has learned from or hasn't been able to replicate? Um. Well, I'm no historian of anything, much less the civil rights movement. Um, but I would say that. So let me let me kind of, as any good advocate, you know, to a question that comes from a reporter, I'll just answer the question I want to answer. Uh, <laughs> so my answer would be that um, I just had a great answer to it. I told you. <laughs> Such a good line too. Um, so. Immigration is not an economic issue. It's not a question of economic policy. And I think that a lot of us in the movement have always thought about it as like, let's get business involved. Because if we make the business case, then everything else will fall into place. A big part of the strategy in 2011 when we started to figure it out is that we decided to treat this as a social policy issue. We decided to treat this as an issue where people needed to figure out, okay, how are they going to treat each other? Um, and as we looked at the map, and we overlaid a map of where we needed to build support for immigrants and immigration reform versus where um, the evangelical community was. It was a mirror image uh, or a clean overlap where it was in the southeast, the midwest, and the mountain west where you had the least amount of support for immigrants, but you also had the highest number of evangelicals. You also had the highest density of state and local law enforcement as well as the fastest growth of the foreign born population. So for us, we approached this primarily as a social policy issue a question of social policy, perhaps that's the way that the leadership of the civil rights community approached it, and which is a part of the reason, or the reason why they engaged the, 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 the faith community. Um, and maybe there are parallels, but I just don't know enough about that history to say, you know, you know this is exactly how it fits. Can I ask you a question? You can answer the topic. <laughs> In terms of the, the evangelical community, what So um, yes, I, I have you know I have met and I have come to know a number of uh, evangelical leaders who voted for President Trump, or even on his evangelical advisory board, but they remain completely steadfast in support of immigration reform. So right now, frankly, they are our emissaries into the administration. Uh, the question will be, do they have enough juice with the administration? and Congress to move the needle again in our direction. It's a different environment, it's a different context completely. Um, but, you know, for a number of folks in the faith community, they they took their vote based on the court. Um, and that was their defining issue, and everything else was not even secondary or tertiary, but way down the list. And um, that's, you know, okay, that, I'm gonna respect that vote. Uh, I'm gonna work with it, and uh, um, we'll, go, we'll, we'll work from there. Uh, okay, sure, Hi, Ellie. Thank you so much for visiting us. I'm sure an interesting discussion. Please bring me back in February next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really nice. Although this time of year is also good. Um, I want to go back to your point about messengers. Yep. Um, my name is Elizabeth Anderson. I'm not an immigrant. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. But I have grown up among immigrants as a child, and I live in a city of immigrants now in Miami. And so I see myself very closely. Or very clearly as somebody who can advocate for immigrants and that is a bridge. When I walk into places, I'm very non-threatening. Um, and so I want to understand from you where are the opportunities for engaging in dialogue on a personal <coughs> level with people and sharing experiences. And also, I think Miami in some ways could be a kind of messenger for the rest of the United States for this whole discussion on immigration. And so. 
where are the opportunities for Miami to kind of visit other cities and yeah. bring our message? And so what is, what's your suggestion now that you've crossed the country talking yeah. about this issue? So I was in uh, Houston a couple days ago, a far inferior city, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> but, um, man, uh, this is Facebook Live, too. No, <laughs> bad move, bad move. Uh, um, yeah. But one of the, the institutions that I learned about was the Interfaith Ministry, uh, Interfaith Council in, in Houston. And uh, a friend of mine did a house party in Houston um, where I learned that you know, one of the leaders of the Interfaith Ministry you know, ran a you know, pharmaceutical firm, but very active in the Muslim community, and saw that council as a way to, re to relate to all the other faiths in, in Houston. So I think that you know, I'm sure that something similar exists in, in Miami, um, but I think it's those kinds of institutions that are just becoming more and more important yeah. this time. No, that's a very good point. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. I relate very well with your title. Um, there goes a the neighborhood. Um, just a little personal story, and then I'll throw the question. Um, I came here, my parents brought me here to um, New York, upstate New York in 1976. And um, we moved into a small town called Beacon, New York. I don't know if you're probably familiar with Beacon, but that wording, there goes the neighborhood, applied to us when we moved there in 1978. And the neighbors around us, the for sale signs went up. Um, the neighbor very closest to us then stayed on after they got to know us a little bit and we were there for a few months. We started going back and forth and having tea and coffee and so on. So. Um, you know, relating to persons on a personal level, getting to know them, them getting to know you, I think is, is very, very, you know, is right on the, on the money. Um, I, I work in an immigrant community now, or have been all my life, pretty much. I'm an attorney, I'm an immigration attorney. And um, I just think that, I, or I wonder if part of the anxiousness that some Americans are feeling comes from the fact that the new immigrants are more outspoken and um, are sort of demanding to be heard as a new American. Um, you know, when, when my folks came here, when my parents came here, they would say things like, it's their country, you know, so you have to be quiet and, you know, all of this. And I feel that I'm an American immigrant and um, I have a contribution to make to this country and so I don't feel like, and I don't say it's their country, I assert myself, I'm here and I'm contributing and my children are born here and so I just feel that we are more outspoken and we feel more confident in ourselves and that we are part of this new America and so perhaps that's what's also causing this anxiety. So uh, where, where did America. you say your parents are from? Jamaica. So it's funny, like the, the, the flip side of that is that when people come to me and say, well, the immigrants aren't assimilating. Well, you're assimilating, all right? Uh, um, so in the, in the book, I interviewed some leadership from uh, California. And uh, it was also based on a, a trip that I did with the State Department to France and uh, Belgium. And I developed a kind of quickly a, a framework that I think applies here. And it's identity integration influence. And the idea is that as an immigrant moves from Jamaica, uh, they come and they're Jamaican. Then they fit into a larger diaspora of folks from the Caribbean. Then you become a citizen and you see yourself as American. And then you come back to being, okay, well, I'm, you know, you know hyphen, you know, Jamaican hyphen American. Right? So there's a change in identity for the immigrant. Then Along the way, you also integrate. You, you, know, you own a business, you lead an organization, you become uh, a part of the community in one way or another. And then ultimately, this is what you're getting at, you, we seek to influence the system, whether it's through running for office or uh, uh, you know, serving on a board of a community-based organization or a business or a corporation. So the way I saw this is that there was a journey, you know, the change in identity and integration of the community and then an influence of the community on the American culture. And yes, I'm sure that puts people a little bit on their heels and you know, but that's okay. That's good. You know, it's the process. It's what, I mean, I think that's always happened in the country, in the United States, and um, we're just kind of going through another phase of it. It just seems to be a little bit bumpier this time. 
Um, sorry, sorry. Uh, my name is Alan Gomez. Uh, Bowie, thanks for doing this. And uh, I, I just want to kind of go back to something from the start where you talked about shifting from a political strategy to a more cultural one and trying to get out into the country and say open the eyes of more people to the issue of immigration and that sort of thing. But if the ultimate goal is eventually to get some sort of immigration reform, obviously it has to come back to a political strategy at some point. So my question is how this tactic you know, it's one thing to reach citizens, residents of a certain community, but if your end goal is to get a congressman whose district is gerrymandered and safe, who, which is 70, 80, 90 percent white, who has three people ready to primary him further to the right if he slips up on anything, how do you reach that congressman? That is the, the you know, $100 million question. Um, one of the tactics that we employed and I wrote about that I, I think applies moving forward is a purely cultural strategy that leads ultimate that leads to political change. So we partner and, and help uh, uh, this a coalition called the Evangelical Immigration Table. It's one of the uh, largest coalitions of uh, um, the big evangelical organizations across the country, like the National Association of Evangelicals, uh, the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference, and others. You know, at full force, they can you know this coalition can reach. 50 million people. So in 2013 and 14, we uh, worked with them to create a strategy that ran Christian radio ads uh, in target districts, where the ad, the voice of the ad was a um, pastor, ideally from that state or that district, speaking to the biblical underpinnings behind the need for immigration reform. So it's a values-based message. And then it wasn't an ask to call your congressman, it wasn't an ask for your congressman to vote X way on said bill. The ask was, again, Christian radio, to pray for our elected officials. A uh, evaluator from uh, University of Pennsylvania looked at the campaign, completely unbe unbeknownst to us, and found that over the course of the campaign, which was about 18 months, ran in about 65 congressional districts, <clears throat> 15 states, and we found that, or she found that, over the same period of time, off by 15 points. So did we ever reach that tipping point of some, you know, the person who heard that ad picking up the phone and calling that member of Congress and saying, I want you to take this vote? We didn't get there. But that one tactic uh, and the results from it showed me that there's an opening. If you reach people based on a values framework that they can identify with, um, and you can, you know, over time, you know, provide them the information to get to that next place. We're just going to take one last question because all the oh, thank you because all the answers are in the book and there's some great recipes. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I have a microphone so now I can talk. Thank you so much. Um, I'm a millennial Argentinian Canadian Miami. <laughs> wow, so that's like this, a trifecta. Yeah. <laughs> this speaks to me, and if you recall, on Super Tuesday, the Canadian immigration website crashed. Right, so here's my question. Having lived in Canada as an immigrant in a place where you hear more than 50 languages on a daily basis, what's, what's to learn from them? Why, why the difference? Why are they so open to immigration when both the US and Canada are made from immigrants? Yep. What happened there? So, uh I was in a meeting with the uh, Canadian Minister for Refugees and Immigrants um, last fall sometime, and we ended up talking about their uh, um, refugee resettlement program. And one of the programs that they have is that an individual, so here in the US, an organization sponsors a refugee, whether it's a, you know, a nonprofit or a church, but it's an institution. In um, uh, uh, Canada, they allow individual families to sponsor refugees. Um, and as we were talking about it, I realized like, that is really cool. Right? It's because it, it, it personalizes that attachment of the family to the refugee. I was sponsored, and I wasn't a refugee. Um, and that just doesn't exist here in the US. Uh, so what's the difference between, you know, what's the matter with America when it comes to Canada and immigration? Um, I don't have a good answer for you. I just think that there is a, you know, the US is, a much larger country, a uh, much more diverse country. Um, I think the factors that are in play in the U.S. are uh, um, lead to a much more polarized environment. Um, I think our economy tends to has 
many more pushes and pulls on it by region. Um, and also, our culture is much more diverse. Um, and that makes it much more interesting and fun for the future, but also a lot more difficult in the present. Well, uh, thank you very thank much you. for <laughs> thank you all.